going to just go ahead and follow up on some of those comments that I was just typing out answers to, but it hit 10 o'clock, so I decided to just go, go live and um, so you can see me. Now, um, I will admit my front-facing camera has been um, glitching, kind of disconnecting from my computer today. Um, I restarted my computer and it seems like it's doing much better. Although it looks like it might be lagging a little bit. I'm hoping that the audio is okay. Um, all right, so of course you can see all three specimens. Um, the one that's underneath the microscope right now is the male velvet ant. He's really cool from the top, but he's even cooler from a lateral point of view. I'm gonna show you this really fast. How crazy that abdomen is. I just think that that's really cool. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to show you this uh, male velvet ant. He was the one I was leaning towards, um, and is who Susan had suggested. But we can look at the other two specimens. Um, this carabid here. Uh, this is a carabid here. Um, he's this uh, long cylindrical friend. I'm not exactly sure what, I wouldn't know other than down to family much more about this specimen. Um, I can tell you that he's predatory and I can show you what characteristic I look at to determine the family level identification for carabidae. I believe, um... Well, I've shown you the expanded trochanter on other carabids, but we can show you that again. And this is the tiger beetle that I was looking at. Um, this tiger beetle has a really, really cool texture. So if we zoom in really close on this fella, and yes, see it's this really beautiful metallic kind of almost red, almost purpley color. And then when we look at its front legs, this was really cool when I first saw it, so I wanted to share this with you. Um, the tarsal segments of the front legs are this metallic blue color. And I didn't notice that when I collected it because all I was seeing was this like very metallic red body that the tiger beetle has. Um, it also has, oh, that's nice, the way it lit up like that. It also has those two vertical kind of pale lines on it. I also like the, the crazy, like, the white, the white CD on the pronotum here. Yes. So that's not a coloration, those big white brush-like things right there. That's actually um, CD that are going this way. Um, hey, Dob. Yay, the whole crew's here. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today and, um, and hanging up. I love, wait, is that a stinger or just the, give me a minute. Um, I wish I knew which specimen we were talking about. The only specimen that should have a stinger is the only specimen that should have a stinger would, actually, this shouldn't have a stinger. This should be a male. He has wings. Let's look. All right, so that is, there is the other leg behind it that's pointing down. That's the leg right there, almost in focus. But when we focus up on the abdomen, there is this little bit of an upturned hook. And I wonder if that is for use in the mating process. The male velvet ants should not have stingers. <laughs> um, male bees, wasps, and ants don't have stingers at all. So my guess is that that is just some type of uh, mating object, mating thingy. So after seeing all three of them, the velvet ant, the carabid, and the tiger beetle, 
I guess the question is, which one would you like to kind of take a deep, deep dive on and check out? I do know that the Velvet Ant that we're looking at here is significantly different from the Velvet Ant we did before. Um, we have sketched all three of these families in the past, but you did ask for me to pull some specimens that were recently pinned. Um, I also have a Longhorn Beetle and a Katie did that we could do. Um, the Longhorn Beetle is fairly large. The Katie did is pretty cute. The Velvet Ant last year was a female. Awesome. So at least this one has wings, which makes it significantly different. Um, sounds like a plan. Um, I'm thinking we do the Mutilid. All right, so, um, I don't know, um, I don't know identification on this Velvet Ant, um, past family level. There we go. Alrighty. I don't know, um, identification of the Mutilid past the family level, so I'm just gonna write, um, male Velvet Ant. Now, um, this Velvet Ant was collected at nighttime. There are a series of Velvet Ants that are actually nocturnal. A lot of them are diurnal, and you'll see them crawling around in the day, going to flowers, this, that, the other thing. But there are a handful of them, this one included, that only fly around at nighttime. And you can find them in rest areas and gas stations attracted to light. Um, they are in the family Mutility, and obviously they are an ant, so their order is Hymenoptera, the bees, wasps, and ants. Um, with this specimen here, oh, let me go put the other two specimens away so we don't bump them on accident. Don't need to be bumping brand new specimens. Sometimes, after after using my collection to teach for over a year, a year and a half now, um, after using my collection to teach for so long, I now realize why the teaching collection at MSU had so many missing body parts on the insects. You know, just interacting with them, even if you're super duper careful, you end up breaking little pieces. Wait, it's an ant? Thought they were more like wasps. Um... They are more like wasps. They are in the, uh, they're in the order Hymenoptera. All right, so that's the order with all bees, wasps, and ants. All right, all ants are in the family Formicity. All right, so they're not an ant because they're not in that family formicity. They're in the utility, which makes them significantly different from ants. They, um, all of the females do have stingers, um, and I would say they are definitely closer to a wasp than an ant in that they, um, in that they are parasitoids, so they are feeding on actually other generally ground nesting um ground nesting bees and wasps um they are not social so you don't have any colonies like ants do um so they're definitely closer related to wasps than to ants but they're just called an ant because they look like ants <laughs> um common names right and i feel like uh, we talked about how um, if it's not a true, um, if, if the word is not true, like if it's not a true bug or a, or a true fly, the, the words should be together. But velvet ants are one of those that make an exception to that rule. And I'm not 
sure exactly why. Um, it's possible that the first velvet ant that was identified, people actually did think it was an ant, so they called it a velvet ant, and then it just stuck. That's my guess. All right, but we do have the ability, if I scooch the specimen very carefully up just a teeny bitty bit, maybe, yes, we can see the front of the head and the back of the abdomen, so I do have the ability to measure it from the front to the back, and I have my measurements in inches right now, so I will go ahead and switch it back over to centimeters for, um, for us. Look at that. So, um... This specimen from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen is 1.27 centimeters long. Um, and I think, funny enough, before I moved that, it is exactly 0 .50 inches. Exactly a half of an inch. That's kind of cool. That makes me happy. 1.27 centimeters is our measurement from... Um, the head to the back of the abdomen. And I guess my question to you is close enough to half an inch. Yeah, exactly. Um, bloop, bloop, bloop. My question to you is do we want to draw it from the top or the side? But honestly, I want to... There's a part of me that wants to draw it from a lateral point of view because if we look at it from a lateral side, we only have to draw one set of legs and... We can see the cool shaping on the abdomen, and you can't see that shaping on the abdomen from the dorsal point of view. Plus, it looks like we'll be able to get a little closer. That's so cool. <sighs> All right, so let's see, let's see, let's see. All right, something that I do want to talk about really quickly, um, especially with such a wasp, they do have very wasp-like bodies, and I want to um, talk really quickly about the term mesosoma and metasoma. Um, so, uh, they're terms that, uh, I haven't introduced too many times, but they are mostly specific to hymenopterans, bees, wasps, and ants. Um, you can also say prosoma, it just means the head. Um, when we're talking about meso and metasoma, we're talking about body regions, kind of like the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, except that they're more kind of what they look like. So prosoma would just be the head. The mesosoma is this large section right here. It ends right around here, and it's what people would generally consider the thorax. Except that the last segment of the thorax is actually this part right here. All right? Um, and so we consider from the waist to the end the metasoma. All right, so this is the metasoma, and this is the mesosoma. And um, uh, if you were talking thor head, thorax, abdomen, the thorax would start here and go to... I will have to zoom in and check it out if this is the end of the T3 or if this is. Um, so when we zoom in, we'll be able to see the suture, and I can tell you which one's which. But the, but the thorax is significantly longer than the... Um, than the mesosoma. And so that's why we, that's why entomologists do make that differentiation. Um, just so that, just so that y'all know. Okay. <coughs> All right. So, uh, as you know, I like to go ahead and start my sketch with a really, really light outline, and then I go back over it and kind of darken some of those lines and change them, modify them as we are, as we zoom in and um, determine like finer details of our velvet ant. Um, up here at the front, you can see that uh, you can see that peg that the head is resting on, and sometimes we talk about that that there's out of the out of the thorax there's this short little peg that the head rests on, and it gives 
gives um, it gives the uh, velvet ant the ability to kind of turn its head in all of the directions. So I'm actually gonna start. I'm gonna start with this neck region here, and I'm just gonna make two really short horizontal lines and give myself that really nice short neck region, and then this head. is honestly very round. It's quite interesting. All right, the back of the head, the back of the head or the, the side that's closer to the thorax is on a little bit of an angle. Um, further, it's on, it's on this angle. All right, and then I'm just gonna start it on that angle and then round it off fairly circular. Um, we're gonna get rid of some of those sharp edges when we zoom in, I, I assume. Um, so we've got a little bit of a start of a head here. And then that, that we're gonna, we're gonna use the proper terms. The mesosoma um, comes up above the head, probably time and a half, so probably right around here. And the mesosoma, so this is the part of my sketching that I always make sure that, like, kind of, this is the part where we get all of our ratios taken care of, so that when we are zooming in, our insect doesn't get all wonky. Because <laughs> sometimes that happens when you're zooming in and out and in and out. Um, and because we fit the whole thing under the microscope, we can do things like this. Uh, it looks like... If we round up just a little bit, the uh, mesosoma is about double the length of the head. Um, my measurement on the head was 0.19 centimeters, and the mesosoma was about uh, 0.42. So uh, just a little bit longer than double the length of the head. So if I take the head here, I go one, two, I got the end of it, and it's going to come... So that's going to give us just a, just an estimation of the, um, of the thorax. And you know what? I am realizing I started the head too large because that is not going to be enough room for the abdomen. Sorry guys, I'm going to really quick start this one over just a little bit smaller. Um, I want to make sure I can get that whole abdomen with that um, curved, with that curved spike there. That's better. All right, so we've got that head with that peg from the mesosoma. I just came up and created myself a little box. I rounded off the top, and then I angled this one back down in the opposite angle and pulled it straight over and pulled it over. I did U it out just a little bit. Maybe it shouldn't be as u It should be fairly straight, actually. Um, and then when we are adding the legs, we'll go ahead and add the hips or the coxa. Um, out a little further. All right, so um, from the mesosoma, we have that very, very familiar wasp waist happening. Um, from the connected at the base, we're gonna be coming out as so. And then um, there are two, uh, how do we call these? nodules. They look like, um, there are kind of the, there's a, there's a constriction right here, which I think is kind of nifty. Um, so we've got that narrow wasp waist. It's coming up, arching up. And then we have this abdomen here. Now I was reading a little bit about velvet ants while, um, I was reading a little bit about velvet ants because I, I had a guess that we were gonna do the velvet ant today. Um, we've been doing a lot of beetles, and so I thought that if you had the choice of doing another one, we might do this one. Um, so I was reading up on them just a little bit, and I learned, because I always knew, I knew that velvet ants were, um, I knew that velvet ants were parasitic, but they are ectoparasites. 
Hey, <laughs> ecto. So they're ectoparasites, meaning that they don't actually, um, they don't, uh, go into the, their grubs don't go into, um, immature wasps, uh, or wasp larvae and feed from the inside. They exist on the outside of the wasp. They are also, um, an idiobiont ectoparasitoid. And let's get some fun words up here because I learned these two recently. Um, idiobiont means that they actually have the ability to stop the development of the larva that they're feeding on. So they exist on the outside of the larva and they, after, after, um, I guess the sting, after they, after they start feeding on the grub, the grub can no longer develop and can no longer molt. And therefore, it actually helps protect them because they're on the outside of the body. So the, the, the grub can't shed its exoskeleton and get rid of it. Does the length include the entire stinger? Um, you know what? Let's get a measurement from a lateral point of view because from the top, I couldn't see what we were, I, we couldn't see what we were looking at right there as the stinger. So, um, if I don't include the stinger, and it's not a stinger, by the way, um, it is male, so it does, shouldn't have, it doesn't have a stinger with, but without that, um, abdominal appendage, um, it is 1.27, and then with, it is 1.31. So that measurement did not include the abdominal appendage. And if we do a little bit of math, it looks like the appendage might be something like 0 0.04 centimeters. Would that be a half of a millimeter? 0.4 millimeters? All right, so um, I do want to add the approximate location where the wings do connect. So that's going to be right around here. And look at me remembering the name of this, um, of this shoulder plate. So I created this little D here. That is the tegula. I believe that is the right word. I think I forget the word tegula every time we teach and I have to remind myself of it. Yes. So um, that's the tegula and it's where the wings get connected to and it's kind of like a um, it's kind of like a shoulder pad for the wings. It protects all the muscles inside and it helps us determine where the wings are going to be. And then I can take this line here and kind of move in an upward shape and then come back. We're going to call All right, we've got some wings happening here. And I wanted to make sure I got the wings at least to where, at least to the proper length. And then when we, um, when we zoom in, we'll be able to kind of fix those details. But that, I think, is actually a, a decent start to our velvet ant. It gets, it gets some graphite on the paper. Um, and it also, uh, it also helps us kind of stay within our lines. And now we know that it's going to be, it's going to fit on the paper, which I love. All right, let's see. Let's zoom in on the head. Now, the only thing that we miss from a lateral point of view on this, uh, Whoa! Um, the only thing that we miss from a lateral point of view are the really cool ocelli that this, uh, that this velvet ant has. This velvet ant has, um, three ocelli. Look at that! What? So, uh, 
I'm um, turning the specimen a little bit because I want to see if that was really a pelp, a maxillary pelp. But there's the uh, there's the ocelli if you'd like to look at them from this point of view. All three of them in a little triangle. Um, they are also kind of on a mound on the top of the head. So the one on the front is looking forward, and the two on the top, the two on the back are pointing um, out. They're on that hill. I'm gonna flip this specimen upside down. I'm gonna take off its label. Don't let me forget to put it back on. Okay, this friend here has the longest palps I've seen on a velvet ant. Look at, he looks like he has a mustache. His palps make me really, really happy. So this is his, um, this is his mouth. I'm only a little bit confused. There seems to be too many segments in here. But um, if we look right around here and here, there should be four palps that we are looking at. So I think that there's one here and here. Those two long ones are likely maxillary palps. And it looks like right here and here, there are two kind of shorter ones, and those would be labial palps. So, to get you guys the words, maxillary palps are going to be the longer ones. Um, generally, they're the ones that are kind of on the side here. They exist on the segment directly underneath the mandibles. So they are the ones that are helping kind of push food into the mouth or into the mandibles. And then the palps, the other set of palps that it has are called labial palps. And labial palps exist under the maxillary palps, and they're connected to the labium, which is the bottom jaw of the insect, and generally they are shorter, and they kind of face up like this, and they make this movement here. So um, you've got the maxillary palps that are up here and push in this way, and then the labial palps that push in this way. And when they're all working at the same time, that helps our that helps our velvet ant significantly to to uh, to eat and push all that food into its mouth. And I love that its palps are so giant. Okay, now we can go back to looking at it from a lateral point of view. Because that's totally what we're seeing here, and that's why I was confused. I was like, those, it almost appears to be, it's, it's long, they're long enough that they could be kind of short antenna. That's crazy to me. So right there, those are, those are going to be the longer ones. Those are maxillary palps. You're so cute. Okay. All right. So, um, I'm going to admit she's, he's going to be a, a little, he's going to be a little tricky to sketch, but we're going to do our absolute best. And you know, first time for everything. This is the first time I pulled this specimen out and really looked at it underneath the microscope. So, um, you're going to experience it with me. Um, and I need to know if those palps, um, if this specimen is named after its palps. I need to know what species names it is because I would definitely have named it like mm, 
something, some, let's see, what's a mega palpi eye or something? Ha ha ha. I saw another insect with super long palps the other day. A handsome trig. I wonder if it has huge palps for the same reason. Lifestyle is surely different. Handsome trig. Aww. You saw a handsome trig? I'm a little bit jealous. Uh, that is a red-headed bush cricket. That is so cool. And you know what's funny is my mother actually saw one of these recently too. She sent me a picture of one and I actually hadn't seen a handsome, um, I hadn't seen one before. And so it's kind of cool that you got to see it. I have not seen one in real life yet. My mother sent me a picture of it, and I was like, that is so cool. And she said, you have to let me know if you want me to collect things. And um, I think that that cricket was just a little bit too fast for her to actually catch for me. But she got a picture, which was awesome. All righty. So I want to start with the compound eye. That's where I want to start. Sometimes I wish my microscope had a micro focus. There we go. That's that's pretty close. Whoa, that's something I didn't notice either. I'm learning all types of stuff about this velvet ant. All right, so um, there's one thing that I want to point out before we really start diving into this one. I know likely you all have already, but you notice how... There's a part of me that just wanted to make this compound eye circular, but there's this region right here that kind of comes in, has a, a little bit of a concavity to the, uh, to the compound eye. This right here and then down to this point, that's the mandible. It backs up almost all the way to the compound eye. That's fun. Okay. All right, now we've got that, that sorted out. I'm gonna make, see our compound eye is like half of the size of the head. Um, and I'm gonna start it right around here, which, and I wanna start it with this U shape because it's going to, it's not gonna be completely straight down across. And I wanna make sure that that compound eye does bulge over and above where I imagined the head outline is gonna be. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna go up and out and over that line and then back down, but I'm not gonna finish up here in the front because we know that there are mandibles here to be added. So I'm gonna add just that little concavity up here in the front to fit in that little bit of mandible there, which is nifty. Um, up here on the top of the head, because the compound eyes bul are bulbous so high above the head, we cannot see the ocelli from a lateral point of view. Um, the top of the head here, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that this stays nice and rounded rather than having that, um, rather than having that straight, that kind of corner there. And then what I want to do is kind of imagine, maybe I'm actually going to add the mandible first. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this, um, region here that I left room for the mandible and I'm going to curl the mandible down. Now it looks like a bird. <laughs> um, so our velvet ant's a bird. Um, and we've got this angle and we've got up here. So our goal is to kind of angle the head forward some and then round this region out here. So that's going to give us the shape of our kind of our finalized shape of our of our head here and then I'm actually gonna I'm gonna cut it a little bit short because I want to make sure it doesn't line up exactly with those mandibles I want the mandible to come to come outside of the head just a little bit um, I am gonna go ahead and cross hatch within the compound eye because as you know we need all those little omatidia or those little individual lenses now I'm thinking 
looks kind of funny, but I will fix it. Um, because we've got the mandible here, but we now we need this region up here that's kind of above. So if we come right here, kind of, if you take this arch and follow it through, you will still have some head region that we have to add. And it's going to be coming up, and then it's going to go mostly kind of flat-esque because that is where our antenna get connected to right here. This is where um, this is where our antenna are connected. And then I kind of want to make it more narrow. I think that's better. All right, so um, it's really hard to see a lot of those mouth parts because they are underneath the um, underneath the antenna, and unfortunately, we can't just focus past them like you want to, you know. Um, but I do know whereabouts those uh, labial palps are coming out, so they're going to be coming out right here from directly underneath the uh, mandibles, and they appear to be. Let's see if I can count the segments. One, two, three, four. Four segmented. There's one segment that is hidden underneath the, um, there's one segment that's hidden underneath the antenna. So we're going to go, f I'm going to put my, my Mac, these are maxillary palps. I'm sorry if I said labial. Um, I'm going to put my maxillary palps moving forward. So I'm going to go one. Two, three, four. All right. And that, they do look about as long as the head. So I think that that's a proper, like, uh, illustration of them. It looks kind of funny. So I'm going to give it the other one, too. One, two, three. And I'm just going to make them meet in the front, kind of like he's doing this. Um, so that's kind of fun. I like him. I think he's cute. All right, let's see if we, as we're finishing his body, he kind of starts to come together. Uh, let's, I do kind of want to add the antenna. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. We're going to count that one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, I count 12 antennal segments, and that starts here at the base. Our first segment is fairly wide, and these antennae are kind of curly, and velvet ants do kind of tend to have these cute little curly antenna. So instead of curling over the head like this specimen is, I want to curl my antenna this way. I'm going to curl them up. Thickness-wise, how do the antenna compare to the maxillary palps? All right. Um, let's go ahead and look. I am not going to be able to give you exact measurements, but I can give you kind of like a ratio in between the two, right? So if I leave the focus right at this level, I can, oh, stop. It's moving. Tell it to stop moving. Why is it moving? All right, so, hey, come back. All right, so the... At this focus, the width comes out to 0.1 centimeters. It's not 0.1 centimeters, but that's just at this focus. What I can do is now, or at this zoom level, um, now I can measure this one and I can give you a ratio. Alright, so 
the widest part of the late of the maxillary palps is 0 0.05 and the width of the antenna is 0.1 so they are pretty much exactly double in width so if you take the width of your maxillary palps and you double them that should be the width of your antenna um, but I do believe that this first segment of the antenna is wider than all of the other segments. Um, so if I get the measurement of the width of the first segment, yeah, it's more like 0.15. That's a fascinating number. Is that really right? We're going to try it one more time. No, that's right. Okay, so, ah. so then what we learn is that this segment here, the maxillary, the maxillary palps, if we call them the width of one, the first segment of the antenna should be a width of three and the rest of them a width of two, if that helps. The antenna are twice as thick. Except this segment right here, which is three times as thick. Also, the antennal segments, once you get past that first segment, they do stay mostly even in width until the very last approximately three segments. Um, and all of the segments are very uh, kind of smoothly connected to one another. That's different than a lot of the beetles we generally look at where there's this huge segmentation in between the antennal segments. So this um, fella right here is pretty smooth, which is what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to go ahead and just, instead of making the segments individually like I normally do, I'm going to make them all at the same time. I'm just going to go... And then I'm going to start from the other side. This light sketchy line was just to help me with the width, with the length. The end of the antenna is also not pointed. It is narrower than the rest, but it's not at a sharp point. So make sure you don't like end it at too sharp. not horrible. Alrighty, and I said 12 segments, so this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That actually didn't turn out too bad. Right, velvet ant up here so it doesn't just say labial pulps for the entire class. <laughs> Alrighty, up here at the top, let's see, we're gonna go ahead and kind of darken this. The, uh, the neck region is flat on the top, but it is arched down on the bottom, and then we do have a number of segments here. Um, you can see the, uh, you can see kind of the sutures or the division between the exoskeleton plates. Which is kind of cool. To help you out, um, the first, I'm going to draw these, um, the plates a little bit lightly and then I'll darken them in. So the first plate is right around here along the top of the head and it is U-shaped and it goes over to the tegula. Um, 
and then it does come down and forward right about where the uh, right about where that leg is connected, and that's the first segment of the thorax. Um, if you were talking about this region right here, kind of on the top, that would be the pronotum coming around, but once you got to the bottom, it's considered a different segment. Okay, then we have this segment here. From here, it goes down and at an angle. And the, uh, the middle leg connects right there where, where this angle ends. And then the hind leg connects almost right here, kind of on that stem. Where we were saying is like, this is technically the thorax, even though it looks like it's part of the abdomen. Um, and I do believe that there is one more segment that kind of crosses up right around here. All right, so we're going to start... Um, solidifying some of these or darkening some of these. Erg. Okay. Um, from the neck to that, where that first suture or that first like uh, plate division is, there is a little bit of an indentation here. So I'm going to make this an arch here and then I'm going to arch it up to the top of the back so that you have just that little bit of an indentation. Um, we are going to be adding the coxie and the legs down here. So I'm not going to do the bottoms as um, right at this very moment. That right there is the tegula. In this specimen, it is less D-shaped and more like a V. It's a little bit sharper here. Um, but it still does connect up to the wings that go up this in this direction. I am going to go ahead and just give it at least the portion of the wing that um, is going to be interacting with the mesonota, meso. Soma. Um, and then this is going to come around and move down, but then it hits the wing. So we're going to scooch it over so we can see the rest. All right, so it is angling itself down, but then once it gets right around here, we have a, a, a sharper decline. And you can see this is where, right around here, is where that second pair of legs are connected. And then the third pair of legs are right there, right at that, uh, right at that wasp waist. Check that out. All right, so we've got this taken care of. Alrighty, so um, let's go ahead and add the legs. I kind of want to look at the front legs from this side because I think we'll be able to see the front leg a little better on this side. Yeah. Whoa. Look at that. So the first tarsal segment is right here of the, of the first leg, and we could all speculate together what the purpose of this is, but there is a darker sign of sclerotized U on the bottom. This would be on the bottom of the tarsal segment. It looks like it's on the top. Right? But that's just because the tarsi are like this. So um, if we were to draw it like it was walking, that U would actually be on the bottom of the foot. I have a guess. I would guess that that point, that U-shaped region, is for cleaning the antenna. But I'm not exactly sure what, why. 
Like, why an additional piece like that? That's really nifty. Okay. That's it. That's all, folks. Okay. So, um, right around here at where the comes up and the tibia comes down. So, right here at the bottom, I'm just going to create kind of this U-shaped here. Uh, that's going to be the coxa. It's a little bit tricky to see from this point of view. And the femur and the tibia are actually pretty short. You can see that they only go up about halfway up the mesosoma. So if I come here and I create this, it kind of gets a little bit wider in the middle. Just arches out just a little bit. We've got that femur that comes up. We have the tibia that goes down. And the tibia does end at an angle I'm seeing. So, my question is, if it was walking in the proper direction, think, the angle is going to be wider on the back than at the front. Sometimes it takes a little bit to, to reshape these guys. All right, so we've got the coxa coming up, the, the coxa down here, femur, tibia, and then we have all of these tarsal segments. And these tarsal segments, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five tarsal segments. But the first one is wonky. I don't know how I feel about this first segment because it has um, tarsal segments ever. Um... So it's kind of shaped like a car without a wheel. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of. She, how she says she thinks it is the opposite, longer on the top. You know what? I think you're right. But then we still have this segment that kind of has this arch here. And is fairly long. Let's see. And then after that significant little kind of arch here, there are a series of hairs of... Um, I would, I kind of want to call them hairs, but they look almost more like spines. They look sharper than hairs. Um, and they exist, there's about three of them on the bottom of this first segment right here. I always want more light on the microscope. Right, and then we have, if I turn this just this way, I think we can get all of the segments in focus at the same time. There we are. Okay, so um, now we have one, but two, three, four are all these triangular segments with the um, with spiny looking doodads on each side, and then the fifth one 
is more of what we call a raindrop shape segment with the two claws. So if we draw those, they look a little bit like this. We have one triangular shape, two triangular shape, three, and these ones do get smaller and smaller as they go on. So four, and then the fifth one is this kind of raindrop shaped segment with the two claws. And I would say that this is a fair length for the um, leg in general. So now that I've got most of this leg situated, very good. Now I've got most of this leg situated, I can darken the, the uh, mesosoma around it. We do have this large plate here that is the second segment of the thorax that comes all the way down to this point here. And you can actually see the coxal um, segment right here. The, uh, the coxy, so this is this whole big segment, this whole segment in here, but then the coxy is right here, and it's this last little triangular piece, and then the femur comes up, the tibia comes down, and this is the start of the tarsal segments. You can see those are a little bit blurrier, and we'll be fixing that shortly as we change focus, but I wanted to show you right here at the bottom to show you that this coxal segment is less roundy and more triangular. So right around there's a part of me that wants to bring this down a little bit more so that there's a little bit more region for this hind leg and then this is going to be where the middle leg is connected and we've got this little triangular piece here that's going to be the coxal segment and then the rest of this is just the bottom of the mesosoma so this right here that little triangular piece that's the hip that's the coxa oh hey So we regularly aren't able to see the trochanter, but if we look at this side, you can. So this is the coxa right here, and this itty bitty little triangle that starts the femur up in this direction, that's the trochanter. Um, essentially, like, it's the segment between the hip and the femur that, uh, that works as a knee. It helps it bend in a direction. And then we've got the femur coming up towards us. So um, we have, and the coxa is bulbous a little bit past the body. So I'm going to um, change the bottom line here so that it's just a little bit more bulbous. And then I'm going to add, I'm going to erase some of this too anyway, because I want to add this trochanter that is this triangular piece going up. And then the femur. See. See, the femur is um, so far kind of behind everything. And then the tibia is coming forward. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we get a little bit more of this picture of this tibia here. Um, it does have, I want to say one, but it's probably two. And it's only one from this view. One spur, spine, tibial spines. We love the tibial spines. I know we do. So this one is coming back down. Keep in mind, um, a lot of insects have fairly long tibia in comparison to their femurs, but um, wasps and um, velvet ants tend to have fairly short tibia and then long tarsal segments. 
make sure I add this spine here. And then those are the tarsal segments. The first one is significantly longer than all of the others, and we do have one, two, three, four, five segments. So we're going to add those, and that's going to go one, two, Four is tiny. Four. And then five is kind of narrow but longer with the claws. Alrighty, so that is front leg, middle leg, most of the thorax. And most people might think like, hey, where's the other pair of legs? Well, the next pair of legs is going to be connected way back here. And they have very long hind legs. So those hind legs are actually going to go long enough that they go past the end of our abdomen. So that's going to be fun. So the next leg is connected right here. So this is the second segment of the thorax right here. This is going to be considered the third segment. Anyway, the leg is connected right here, kind of at the end. Um, and I am just going to add... There's this conical segment, and I hope that you might not be able to see it. I want you to see it. It's going to be tricky. It's weird how some things are very obvious in my microscope, and then they don't really translate to the camera as well. Here we are. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to describe to you what I am seeing right now. Um, this right here that almost looks like this conical piece that comes out, that's the coxal segment. And it's coming out right here from this last segment. So there's this like little itty bitty kind of, kind of comes out and it makes this little cone segment. Um, or a... Uh, a barrel, I guess, is more like it. A barrel segment here. And then there is another triangular piece that goes from here to here. That's the trochanter. Um, this line coming down through, this kind of foggy line coming through, that's the middle leg. But this going out, that's the hind leg. So this triangular piece here is the trochanter. Um, kind of comes out like... So, and it's going to be pretty much directly behind that leg, but I have the ability to kind of start it, so might as well. We can see the felt line so well, I'm so excited. I'm going to show you a velvet ant felt line. I don't think we saw it last time, um, because it was too hard to see through all of the really fluffy hair. Um, but we can see it this time, and I'm so excited. Okay. Um, so, the femur, oh, it's so pronounced. Oh, it makes me so happy. Okay. We're going to do the hind leg, then we can get to the abdomen. So, I want to make this velvety ant look more like it is walking, so I'm going to be moving the... I'm going to be putting the hind leg so it's not as stretched out. I'm going to be giving it a little bit of a bend here. Um, so the femur looks like it might be a little bit wider at the base than um, it is. 
Uh, it's a little bit wider at the base than it is at the uh, at the end. So we're gonna go just a little bit, and then we're gonna narrow a little bit. And it looks like the femur is going to be as long as approximately until this first, the end of this first node here. I'm gonna use the word node, even though that's an ant term. Sorry. Okay. So that's the femur. Now the tibia is actually short in comparison to what you would think. Um, it's going to be coming down, and it looks like it gets wider at the base and uh, wider at the tip this time by just a little bit. And then you have the tibial spine, of course, and then you have the tarsal segments. At this focus, we can see this guy really is fluffy. It's just thinner. Yeah, it's still fluffy. It's still a velvet ant. It's trying really hard. And you can see that there are two uh, tibial spurs from this point of view, too. So you can add that if you would like. And I do believe the middle leg has two also. It's just that we couldn't see it from the angle we were looking at it. This first tarsal segment is nice and long. It is essentially as long as the tibia. So you can take this length here and you can put it right about here. All right, so that's one. And then two is, I would say, a little less than half that. Two. And then three is just a little bit smaller than two. Three. Four is about half that. And then five is, we're going to say about the length as three. But instead of it being, being flat at the end, it's more rounded and it's got the claws. And you notice that my leg does not go past the end of the abdomen, but that's just because I gave it this little bit of an arch here. If I was to push this down and kind of imagine pulling it out, I believe these tarsal segments would go past the abdomen. So that is going to be the legs of our friend here. And we're going to check out this abdomen, or this metasoma. Look out, fluffy. Fluffy, fluff, fluff, fluff. Love, 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 love. I'm so happy. Okay. All right, so this stem right here is coming out from in between the hind legs of our velvet ant. Um, it connects right here and it comes, rounds up and out. Let's see. All right, so I'm rounding this line kind of up, but trying to work around these legs. Okay. All right, so that's going to be the bottom line that I have. And then the top, narrow at the base, a little bit wider, comes up. There is a little bit of a suture here that creates one kind of segment. And then this one on top. Sort of like that. He's so cute. I do love him. Oh, righty. Ruh, ruh, what, Kashi? Is there something that's gone wrong?
doesn't make me happy. I restarted my computer. Oh. Oh, yikes. I see that. My live keeps flashing red. Ay, ay, ay. What's happening? Alright, so right now it says my stream is healthy, but it's been flashing, I guess. I am sorry that that is happening. I'm not sure how to fix it on my side, but it is on my computer side, not on your computer side. Um, okay. Alright, but it's now going back to more like green and yellow, so it might be my Wi-Fi. It might be my internet. Sorry, guys. Alright, so this is... This is the fun part. This is this is the fun part. Look, we can see the felt line. And the felt line is the defining characteristic of all velvet ants. If you see a felt line, it has to be a mutillid. And the felt line is always on the uh, is always on the first larger segment of the metasome or this like first larger segment right here. Um, it's always a lateral line and it's this thick line of hairs that we call the felt line. And it's right there. It's really difficult to see when you have a velvet ant that is absolutely covered in hair. Sometimes you almost have to imagine that it's there. But on this specimen, it's so easy to say, hey, right there, that's a nice long line of, of short, thick hairs that we call the felt line. Um, what the purpose of it is, I'm not exactly sure, but... It exists, and that's how we know that it's a velvet ant. And there are other species of there are other species and other families of wasps that can look very similar to velvet ants, especially male velvet ants with wings. Um, so when you see that line right there, you know you're working with a velvet ant. That's all. One, two, three, four, five, six. I count six abdominal se um I count six segments. One, two, three, four, five, six. Alrighty. The first one is obviously the largest of all of them. I'm gonna go ahead and just start my um I'm gonna start my uh light lines, my light vertical lines to define segments. So we're going to go, this is going to be about the first segment here. The second segment is like about here. And then three, four, five, six. I think that that's about right. I might move this line just a little bit to the left. That's better. And this line, just a little bit to the left. And that's why I do it light, so that I can see what's happening. And then I'm going to take another very light line, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from the very end of the abdomen, and I'm going to create, I'm going to curve it down just a little bit, and then come back up. That's our lateral line. That's where the um, tergites on the top Meet the sternites on the bottom. Alright, so now we can go ahead and sketch these individually. So I'm going to come in and do the first one. It comes up to here. It comes down to almost this line. And then it is not a complete 90 degree angle. So we are going to just smooth that edge over just a little bit. We're going to arch it down, and we are going to call that that first one right there. And then the tergite on the bottom is not actually in line with this. It is actually um, closer to the waist a little bit. So I'm going to take the line and make it right around here. Alrighty. 
So then we're going to do the next one, which is going to follow approximately the same. And pull it over, wrap it around. This one down. All right, and we're just going to continue that for all of those segments. Until you get to this last segment here, which does something different. This last segment here is just the end triangle. And then it has this upward shaped spine that I do believe is used in the mating process and is not a stinger. And you can go ahead and add all of the beautiful velvety hairs. I do want to add this felt line here because obviously if it's a distinguishing characteristic, it needs to be there. So right around here. The felt line. And I'm going to go back and erase any of these sketchy lines that I don't need anymore. Oh, he's so cool. It's just there so the Velvet Ant is always in style. You know, that's possible. I would believe you. And you know what? The, uh, the Velvet Ant has... Um, I pinned this Velvet Ant so well that these wings are so flat that I might just... I might just leave them kind of as these flat wings here. It, it, it does have four wings. Um, the, you can see the, uh, you can see the, oh no. All right, I'm back. So my audio, my camera right now is running at about 2,700 kilobytes. Oh, it jumped up to 3,500. 3,500 kilobytes a second. But when you lose me, it drops all the way down to like 250. So I'm going to have to figure out what the, uh, why my frame rate is dipping so much. So you can see a little bit of uh, what we would call the anal lobe of the hind wing right here. Uh, so if you wanted to create that little lobe down there, you can. It, it, it does separate a little bit from the wings. And then I do, I'm going to erase some of these sketchy lines. I'm going to add the wings coming out from the other side too, just kind of like so. Maybe a little bit more solid. I'm not going to worry about wing venation. I'm just going to make sure the wings are there. All right. I think I'm happy with him. He's so cute. There's a part of me that wants to fix the head, but I'm not exactly sure how yet. So I'm going to think about it on it a little bit, but I'm pretty happy with the rest of the sketch. I think that that's really all I, where I would want to work on. I love the thickness of the antenna and the way we spoke about those. That was really cool. And it gave me an opportunity to really think about that as I was sketching them. Um, and I really liked... I liked drawing the legs on this Velvet Ant. I think that that was one of my favorites, um, my favorite parts on this guy to draw. You know, admittedly, abdominal segments on wasps is another thing that I enjoy because I like seeing how they kind of overlap in the top and the bottom. Felt line is cool. Yeah, those are, the, those are things that make me happy about this fella here. Um, I, 
did come back, right? I do have audio back and video back. I can see me moving. Okay, good. All right. Beautiful eyes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure because nobody was chatting with me. So, um, awesome. Uh, yeah, so that is, uh, that's our friend here. I hope that you had enjoyed, I hope that you enjoyed drawing him. I certainly did. I think one of, um, I enjoyed the antenna and the legs. I was surprised by the first t tarsal segment of the front leg. I don't know what this U thing is for, and I want to know. I want to know what this is for. And I am honestly curious about the length of the of the maxillary palps because it makes sense for other insects, I think, but I'm not exactly sure what those long maxillary palps would help this velvet ant do. What is the importance of the dark spot on this one right here? That is the felt line. That right there is the felt line. We're not exactly sure what it does. Um, and I didn't see a, we're not sure what it does, but it does, um, it helps you know the other spot. You're right. All the most stylish insects are wearing them this season. The other spot. Let's go look at the, for the other spot. Like this stripe here I don't know I'll admit that cuz this region right here is darker than all of the other ones I would probably say that that's going to help identify it, um, but I couldn't tell you exactly. Um, I would love to have a velvet ant specialist come in and help me identify some of my velvet ants because they are tricky to identify and there's not a good key that I have found yet. Um, I've looked too, looked for a really good velvet ant key to species or at least to genus and they are really hard to find out there. The last time I identified a nocturnal velvet ant, um, it turned out to be a genus that I had never heard of and had to look up, and the um, velvet ant specialist who helped me identify it um, talked to me about the fact that the individual hairs on the velvet ant were barbed rather than um, straight, and these ones look straight rather than barbed. So it's probably a different genus than the one I have already. Yeah. We're gonna go with it's darker there because it wants to be stylish. We're gonna we're gonna fall back on the uh, on Susan's answer. So that's our little friend here. Um, he was collected in a rest area. He was actually one of the first um, insects that I collected in Arizona this year. <laughs> um, I think my actual first one was a very large grasshopper. <laughs> if I devoted my whole life to velvet ants, I'd get increase the frequency of getting stung. Yes, that is so true. I would get stung all the time. I'm sure of it because every time I go to Arizona, I get stung. Um, it's, 
it's no longer a surprise when I get stung in Arizona. It just is dependent on what is stinging me. This year, it was a series of ants. Um, very, very not happy ants. They crawled up, they crawled up my shoes and into my pants, and they stung me on the inside of my knees. That was not fun. And last year, it was harvester ants. Um, do females of the species fly? No. Uh, the females do not have wings. Uh, do the males always have wings or just in some species? Uh, as far as I know, the males of velvet ants always have wings and the females are always wingless. Um, I have not heard of a species that is um, the other way. 90% uh, of female velvet ants are also um, parasitoids on ground nesting bees and wasps. Uh, so uh, generally are not going to be going into hives. They're going to be going into like a cricket hunter's home where there's a where there's a little uh, a, a little wasp grub and the velvet ant will feed on the, the baby velvet ants are going to feed on the wasp grubs. Uh, there is a species in Europe that does feed on um, some type of colonial bee. I believe it might even be a honey bee. Um, but there is a like a, a species that feeds on a colonial bee, and there's another one that feeds on like an arboreal sweat bee or something like that. Uh, but most of them feed on ground nesting bees and wasps. Parasitoids of parasitoids, yes. Aw, Deb, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I really <laughs> meta parasitoids. There is a name for parasitoids of parasitoids. Um, I did some study on blueberry gall wasps one time where I was studying the, because there's, there's a wasp that makes blueberry galls, but then there are wasps that feed on those wasps, and then there's a tertiary parasitoid that feeds on the parasitoids of the gall wasp, which is a plant parasitoid, or plant parasite. So, um, there was like this three layer thing and I would, um, I was rearing out blueberry galls and I was opening them, I was letting the wasps emerge and then I was identifying how many of which species were coming out. Um, that was a fascinating project. Um, I'm not sure if it ever got published. Uh, I wrote most of the paper, but I'm not sure if it ever got, I'm not sure if that it ever got fi finished. Um, but we're going to come over here. Yay! Alrighty, so this, if my front camera refocuses, maybe it's not going to refocus. It didn't like not having a face. Hi. Oh, no. All right, so we're just not gonna we're not gonna mess with the focus on um, this guy right here. But you guys got to see my sketch when I was drawing it. I hope um, I I absolutely love drawing with you ladies, and it's something that I look forward to every week. And there are um, being able to being able to really like dive into sketching and observing insects every week with you and two or three more times with students in classes um, has just like number one increased my ability to sketch by a million and two it just makes me so happy so thank you so much for giving me for for being this outlet for me and for joining me um every week to sketch it is always always appreciated and you know i learn more i learn about my specimens when i'm looking at them and now my students are even asking questions that i have to go and look up sometimes so this is a whole lot of fun um <laughs> they will object to hymenopterans. You know what? Um, 
If they object to hymenopterans, you can just call them fruit flies. Because so many of the little gall wasps and the little parasitoids, people wouldn't think that they're wasps anyways. You look at them and, they, and you would say gnat or fruit fly because they're so tiny. All right. So thank you, Susan and Deb and Hashi, for hanging out with me um, for this entire time, for about an hour and a half. Um, I am teaching all types of classes on OutSchool. This is this has actually been blowing up a little bit. I have another uh, dozen students or so, and I'm now teaching students in Korea and Thailand and Australia. So that's been a blast. I've been teaching a lot of night classes, and it's 12 hours difference over there. Um, keep in mind that you've got to subscribe. All of you girls are, so I know that, and I really appreciate it. That is where you can drop me a donation if you would like to continue to support the work that I do here. Um, uh, this is my email address, Trisha at theinsectopia.com. If you want to share your sketches with me, and um, over there at Insectopia 2015 is my, uh, it's not a hashtag, it's my tag. That's what you can search to find me on Facebook and Instagram. Um, on Facebook and Instagram, I'm Insectopia2015 because somebody else took Insectopia and we need to be just a little bit bigger to kick them out. Um, I hope that one day I can steal Insectopia back. Um, aw, you have some tiny, tiny wasps. I will not tell your roommates. I promise, Susan. <laughs> All right. Um, I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week. We are closing in on the end of the summer, and when summer ends, I am going to start um, picking up uh, Sunday live streams again. I might even make them earlier, like noon, I'm thinking. Uh, so we might be doing uh, early Sunday live streams coming up in the fall. So we'll see what happens there. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and stay buggy. Bye.